yesterday and we all got to enjoy the sunshine. Um, I'm delighted to bring our 2021 Future of Education webinar to you, um, streaming live from Ludgate, as you know. This year's event is presented by the Ludgate Hub in association with our main sponsor, AIB. I'd like to introduce myself to you. My name is Gronio O'Keefe, CEO of the Ludgate Hub. And uh, I want to welcome all of our attendees who are listening and watching from near and far. I would particularly like to extend a warm welcome to our esteemed panelists this afternoon. And uh, thank you for making the time to contribute to this event despite your busy schedules. For those of you unfamiliar with the hub, uh, the Ludgate Hub is Ireland's first rural digital hub. We opened in September, uh, or sorry, in the summer of 2016, and we're located in Skibreen, West Cork. We provide a state-of-the-art uh, 10,000 square foot co-working space with one gigabyte super fast fiber optic broadband connection brought to us by Vodafone and Cyril. So our goal here in the Ludgate Hub is to facilitate the creation of 500 jobs in the West Cork area by 2025. And in pursuing this objective, we have a very impressive track record. We've introduced the innovative co-working space. We support sole traders, startups, scaling organizations, second site strategies, and we offer supportive programs and services. We also offer packages for students through our study space offering. And this year we supported students both in third level and second level education, access education remotely. Recently, we were delighted to accommodate students sitting the HPAT exam and fingers crossed all goes well for them. Our student population is hugely important to us and we have great plans to offer complementary educational services to students of all ages within the West Cork region. Our long-term vision is to make West Cork a thriving local economy with a diverse set of skills and talents. We know that the COVID pandemic silver lining has transformed the way we work and the way we educate, bringing a wealth of opportunities to rural locations. The pace of change of education has accelerated tremendously in the past 12 months. And these cha changes are transformative, which rural communities will reap significant benefits from, enabling access to opportunities that were previously inaccessible. Ludgate wants to be at the epicentre of these changes, enabling and facilitating these opportunities for our community. With that in mind, we are pursuing a second premises to add to our campus, the former Mercy Heights Secondary School in Skibreen, which will have a particular focus on education, innovation and training, targeting all ages and contributing to the educational offerings accessible within the region. This is Ludgate's first educational webinar and we are delighted to bring a stellar panelist group. Uh, we have Lord David Putnam, Ireland's first digital champion, Professor Maggie Cusack of MTU, Professor John O'Halloran from UCC, and Dr. Kieran Collins, Ludgate's education lead, will be our host. We will discuss critical questions such as how the current education system has coped with COVID during COVID, what the key learnings were and are from this period, whether it still makes sense to treat further education and higher education in separate silos, and what new ed tech will be here to stay post pandemic. We have no doubt that you will uh, leave this webinar with exciting, thought provoking material on the future of education. And don't worry about taking notes, we will have a recorded version of the webinar available to you on our website. We'd love to hear from you after our event and we're contactable on info at ludgate.ie. We're active on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram. So to be sure, to, uh, be sure to follow us there and like and share our tweets. So with that in mind, I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Kieran Collins, who will introduce you to our panellists and uh, hope you enjoy this uh, thought provoking session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grania, for that uh, uh, lovely introduction. Um, so, just get my notes up here, guys. I'm delighted to invite you to the Ludgate Future of Education event. As Grania said, my name is Kieran Collins and I will uh, be your MC today. The general outline of the event will be an introduction of our guests, followed by a series of questions. The format will be conversational. We will be running to 4.30 with that format. This will be followed by audience questions, but we will be keeping an eye on questions as they come in through that time. Unfortunately, Lord Putnam will be stepping off the call at this time, but we will have um, uh, Maggie and, uh, and John to field the questions that come in. As we progress, please use the chat function and social media to ask questions. And if you're using social media, please use the ha hashtag Ludgate Education. Our panel includes distinguished education leaders. Professor Maggie Cusick on 1st of January, 2021, 
as Munster Technological University was founded, Maggie took up the role of inaugural president. Maggie has a distinguished career in education, leadership and research. She is a pioneer of geoscience in applying her discoveries about living organisms to advance our understanding of fossils, which allows a more accurate and reliable record of climate change. Lord Putnam is a British film producer, educator, environmentalist and member of the House of Lords. David was Chancellor of the University of Sunderland from 1997 until, the 30, until 2007. In 2019, he was appointed Chair of the Democracy and Digital Technologies Committee to investigate the impact of digital technologies on democracy. This report was published in June 2020. Professor John O'Halloran is interim president at UCC since September 2020. Prior to this, he was deputy president and registrar and led UCC's first academic strategy to reimagine the curriculum, transform assessment, and nurture graduate attributes to position UCC students for their future world of work. Under John's leadership, UCC's Green Campus program became the first third level institution worldwide to receive the Green Campus Award. We have a stellar panel today, but we have also got an outstanding audience. So if you have any questions, please use the chat function or social media to uh, ask those questions. Without further ado, I'm going to uh, ask our first question of uh, Lord Putnam. Um, David, how do you think the education system has coped with COVID-19? On balance, Kieran, I think it's <coughs> coped remarkably well. I think probably better than most people would have expected. Uh, I've tried to jump to a, 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 another point, which is my biggest single concern is that anyone imagines that we're just going to go back to where we were. The key thing now is we've reached the point where we've learned a lot. We've learned what does work. We've also learned to a degree what doesn't work uh, online. What we now need to do is take the best of both and merge them into some new vision of what education can be, what delivery of education can be. So my short answer is, I think it's done remarkably well, but God forbid we think that uh, that's that job done and we go back to the where, to where we were. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, Maggie, in terms of MTU, it is starting on a very exciting journey. How do you think this experience has changed, enhanced the vision of the new university? Yeah, thank you, Kieran. It's certainly um, really interesting to establish a new university to bring together two institutes of technology, establish a new university at the time of a global pandemic. Um, obviously, we can't rerun the experiment and form MTU with and without the pandemic. So the context is, is the one that we, we find ourselves in. So I would say that the vision for MTU to become established as a really great technological university with deep, strong local roots and a global perspective, working closely with, with our partners in co-production to ensure that our learners are work ready. I think all of that in terms of our vision is absolutely enshrined in what we do and it transcends the context and actually transcends the pandemic. But that said, universities are obviously about learning and there's lots to learn from the pandemic. So I think there will be differences in terms of what we do and how we achieve it. But I think the vision um, remains absolutely fixed. So I think the idea of you know, a technological university, we have absolutely outstanding partnerships we work really closely with partners and I think there's great opportunity then for us to co-produce and innovate with them and really respond to the pandemic and as Lord Putnam said there's lots to learn from our ways of learning I think lots of ways that we found were so much better with technology enhanced learning even when we come back to blend I think a lot of what we've learned there will actually come into what would otherwise have been more what we could describe as more traditional approaches. So, and the other thing I think, it really gives us great opportunities for an international reach and to help students arrive and sort of land well with us. So I think there's lots of opportunities where we can really learn on how we built a sense of, of belonging, of community of learners, even though we're remote, and really think how we help with international and indeed all of our students to really hook in and have that sense of belonging, because I think that's really key to success. Thank you, Kieran. 
Thanks very much, Maggie. You, you, you identify some very key points there with uh, blended learning and community. Uh, John, would you like to come in on some of those points, please? Yeah, I think Maggie and David, just following on from both Maggie and David, I think for me, um, this moment has been uh, a pivotal one. I think and that word pivot everybody's talking about, but actually to David's point, if we don't exploit it and use it, we slip back very quickly. Um, and I think what's really interesting for me is I tend to focus on learners, whether the learner, the teacher, or indeed the student. And I think this moment of the last number of months has been a community of learners, both the teacher, faculty, and student, suddenly finding themselves in a place that nobody ever expected. And suddenly finding I've got to do this. And not only doing it, but succeeding. And this morning, I think one of the joys of online is this morning I had a meeting with UNESCO in, in Brussels in relation to the International Universities Association. And we were talking about this very, very topic, um, the fact that learners are, are coming actually to the center of what we're doing today. And that's really, to me, what education is about. And I, when I say learner, I'm talking about researchers. I'm talking about in, people inquiring, people that are curious and delving deeply into, into, the, into the world. And I think for me, um, this moment is important for two reasons. First of all, it put the students at the center. And secondly, it's put carbon footprint at the center. Because today, we have now reduced our carbon footprint significantly. And this is a moment where we can continue to do so. To give you an example, University College Cork carbon footprint in January 2021. This January, the carbon footprint with a thousand students here and about maybe a thousand researchers, maybe 600 students, would take 26,000 trees to offset that carbon footprint. For January 2021, I'd hate to think what it was like in January 2020. So we are in a moment in time where a climate crisis is arising as is in front of us. We have a moment in time where digitalization that we as, as lecturers and faculty and students have become confident that we can use this media. So I'm really excited. And I think, you know, the only things uh, that we need to worry about is A, that we don't slip back. And secondly, that we bring everybody with us because if we leave people behind, then we just create greater inequality and that will make it worse. So I'm really excited about the future. Thank you very much, John. Um, David, could, can you come in there on uh, John's last point about slipping back? Is there a risk that we could slip back into uh, traditional behaviours rather than embracing what is potentially here with us now? The risk, Kieran, is that we don't carry, I think what John and Maggie said is exactly right, we, the, the risk is that we don't carry teachers and lecturers with us. Uh, they have to be part of this journey. And we, in, in a sense, we've got to move at their, at their pace. It's a, in a sense, it's an educative job. I happen to think, we'll come on to it later, I happen to think that the, the ability now to collect data on our students and use that in real time to enhance their learning and then to feed that data to their teachers and, and, and lecturers to let them feel that they know more about their, stu their students and they know, know more about the learning journey they're where they're having difficulties. There's a, a lot going on, which is really, really exciting. Um, I think data will be a bigger of interest to see what Maggie and, and, and John say. I think data and data collection and ethical collection of data is going to be a very, very interesting component in the way in which we address teaching and learning in the future. I, I love that point, uh, David, uh, how we can use data to make better decisions about our teaching and learning. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that, uh, Maggie? Yeah, happy to come in there, Kieran. I mean, the, the first question that, that David answered, and I completely agreed with the answer about, on the whole, the education system has done really well, and I think we should congratulate people for what they have achieved, really. I do have a real concern about the attainment gap, something that's always concerned me, and I think there's a real risk that that gap has widened. So I think as a society, we do have a responsibility for that, and we need to look out for it. And we're talking about education here in the widest sense of the ecosystem. So obviously it's going to impact on people in different ways, depending on the stage. So I think we're going to have to really agree that we have to be mindful and patient and vigilant for, for what support is going to be needed over quite some time to really close that attainment gap. So that's the first point I would want to make. I absolutely agree that the technology gives us access to data and different ways of doing things. We've seen really clearly that there are ways of learning using technology that are far at hands, really take the pedagogy to another stage. And we can do things that you would probably not have thought of in a traditional lecture, you know, to have 
just understanding the attention span, you know, almost like the equivalent of what we have online, a six minute video, no longer. Let's focus on that, break it up. Let's have a quiz. If you are really lecturing in what would otherwise have been a traditional setting, there's a really difficult concept that you're trying to convey. And you know that there's one sort of really common misunderstanding. A really quick snapshot of the quiz. Yes, you've got that data set and you can see, oh, wait a minute, half of this class actually don't understand this. There's no point in me building on sand. I'm going to read. So there's all sorts of ways in which we can use technology to really improve and allow for very different styles of learning that I think we probably um, weren't as good at previously. Thank you very much, Maggie. That's. Uh, um... Lecturers are storytellers, the really good ones tell great stories. And how are we going to tell those stories within this uh, blended digital environment? John, do you want to come in and uh, uh, on that point, please? Yeah, I do. And I think what I'm really interested in is the voice of the student in that story. And if I go back, I go back to 1998. David talked about data. I worked in a liberal arts college in the United States, Colby College. One of the first practical sessions I did with the students was to design an animal that lived in Mars. Uh, we went outside, we got people to look at all the data that had come in from Mars. And what I was trying to do was capture the imagination. Um, and for me, imagination and curiosity are critical to the learning journey. And I, and I pivot myself forward to today as somebody whose PhD was supervised by someone before Watson and Crick worked out the DNA double helix. And yet today, our medical, clinical medical students are spinning molecules in a virtual environment in, a, in a, an augmented environment to look at the impact of those drugs on systems. So I think to me, the, the richness that comes from that immersion in a learning environment, whether it's in music, whether it's in creative practice or in the digital humanities, I think it's, it's a real special moment because actually, you know, it's not, about, it's not about the sage on the stage anymore, actually. It's not about the lecture. It's about enabling learning and inquiry in a structured way and getting to the truth of what's actually happening in the world. And I think the digitalization has unlocked that because it's not about knowledge anymore. Of course, some of it is, it is basic knowledge, but it's actually how we use that knowledge and how we, we leapfrog that into the future in learning what the world looks like. And that intersection between uh, humanities, science, creative practice, to me, explores that amazing space uh, to virtual reality and other areas. And I think the future is just amazing in that regard for both medicine, for pharmacy, for performance, for everything actually, you know. Thank you very much, John. Um, that, I, I think that uh, segues us nicely into um, a, a question that I have for, for David. The education sector is demarcated between the very 20th century notion of further education and higher education being separated and operating as a hierarchy of talent and ability. Will this concept prove fit for purpose as we move into the middle of the 21st century? I don't believe it does, Karen. I've been saying this for quite a long time. I think it's been an artificial demarcation for quite a long time. But can I take this to the issue of the Irish economy itself? Uh, there is a real danger with the Irish economy, but it is because of the very high level and high uh, amount of uptake of, of higher education we begin, we get narrower and narrower and narrower in terms of the skills. Ireland's got enough lawyers, to be absolutely honest. It's probably got enough venture capital. It's got, it's got enough of a lot of the, that white collar jobs. What it's lacking is making things, producing. I'm sure Maggie's going to change all this. In fact, I'm hoping to God she is. <laughs> but David Williams has, has written very well about this. Um, and it's that demarcation that's done the, the, the damage. Now, the job for John, Maggie, myself, people like us, is actually with parents. It's not so much with education, it's convincing parents that there's a world out there which is significantly different to the one over the last 20, 30 years that they assume they have to have for their, for their, you know, for their kids, for their young people. So there's a, there's a real job. The demarcation line is only destructive. There's not one single constructive thing I can say uh, about it. What's most important is that young people have the opportunity to do the things they're really, really good at, preferably the things they really enjoy doing because they're going to do them better and that we get better as a country at making things, producing things and, and creating a different balance, not a different, different balance of, of economy than the one at present we appear to be headed towards. Very good. Um, you make a very strong case there, uh, David. Uh, Maggie, can I bring you in on that, please? Because the Institutes of Technology have um, a very long history of apprenticeships 
where do you see apprenticeships or apprenticeship degrees or even if the terminology apprenticeship is fit for purpose in uh, the new technological university um, framework or in the technological universities of the future? Thank you, Kira. Yeah, at MTU, we are proud of our apprenticeship provision, so our apprenticeships will be at the heart of MTU. I agree with David, there's absolutely no place for that concept of, of hierarchy um, of skills and talent. It's completely outdated. To be successful as a society, we need a whole range of skills, and lots of those are going to be practical skills. So a successful society really recognises the need for a matrix. And I use the word matrix when I talk about skills deliberately, not a hierarchy. I think David's point is really well made. I think if we follow that hierarchy, we end up with a society where everyone wants to be a doctor or a lawyer. And trust me, I have absolutely nothing against doctors or lawyers. We all need them. But a society of only doctors or lawyers is really quite a dysfunctional one. And it's that sort of snobbery and hierarchy really does not serve society well. So I think it's one that we have actually have to actively work against. Thank you very much, Maggie. Uh, John, that, that point on further education and higher education, would you like to comment on that, please? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's two, a few points I'd like to make. First of all, over 20% of the students that come to University of College Cork come to that, those further and higher education, our further education route. So it's a really important part of, of our diversity in our institution. Uh, and that's really rich and really important. Um, and I think if I look at the, the, the system in California, for example, uh, uh, to maybe come away from Ireland for a minute, is the student is at the center of the pathway of their learning. So they may start in a community college, they may go to a university, they may start in university, end up in a community college. So they've created the pathways to enable that to be centered on students rather than on the systems, uh, whether it's UCC or, or MTU or whatever. Um, that's really the wrong way of looking at it from my point of view. The real way to look at this is how do we support our students? Now, some students will need a structure. They will need to know a particular pathways. And it's really important that we don't, that we don't try to fit everything into one place because the, the central axiom in my discipline is diversity begets stability. The greater diversity of pathways, the greater diversity of routes and opportunity is absolutely critical. I'd like to say something about skills and apprenticeship as well, if I may. I think one of the things that I'm really concerned about is that apprenticeship has, has, has got a particular uh, nuance to it that doesn't necessarily mean uh, what a university is about. Um, and it has a particular kind of tone in Ireland that I think that may not be valuable and valued as much as it should. As a researcher, it's an apprenticeship model. As a dentist, it's an apprenticeship model. As a doctor, it's an apprenticeship model. As a lawyer, it's an apprenticeship model. So I think it's really important that we open up our minds that that great learning happens with great peers and great and great mentors. And it's about that apprenticeship, whether it's right through from uh, a carpenter, which my own father was, right through to being a plumber, right through to being a dentist or whatever the case may be. So that nested. The second part is on skills. Um, there seems to be a slightly, again, narrow view of skills. One of the greatest skills that we can teach any person, regardless of where they are, is critical thinking. And that is a skill in the much way as, as doing any other skill. So I think we've got to liberate our minds to the view of supporting a really decent society. And a decent society has people who have many skills, who are contributing to society in different ways. And I've used the phrase many times, we talk about lifelong learning and I talk about life-wide learning. Those dimensions which make people a good, a good citizen, those dimensions that make them good team players, good communicator. And we've got to support our students and our learners and our faculty to develop those ideas, whether it's through an apprenticeship model, through research, right through to being a plumber, or to developing skills in any particular way, you know? Thanks, uh, thanks very much, John. Uh, I'm gonna go back to Maggie on that. Um, you've, uh, you, you've spent uh, uh, time in, the, in Sterling and doing fantastic work over there. How does the UK model compare to the Irish model in terms of lifelong learning? Because I think that that is a challenge for us as a, as a cohort that we only see learning up to a certain point. We get a job and there's no learning thereafter. Is that acceptable? Um, I, I don't think it is acceptable. I mean, we know ourselves and our own roles. We're, we're learning all the time, and I think that starts 
part of um, our very being as a species, isn't it? The drive to know more and to understand the world around us. So I think it's providing people with, with roots to, to really maximise that. So reflecting on my own opportunities when I was Dean at Stirling, um, we'd put in place a, a graduate apprenticeship and that was, um, it was actually in data science. So there's um, sort of traditional students doing their degree in data science and then there's the same degree done by graduate apprenticeship. And what that actually meant was it could be employers having the opportunity to upskill their current workforce. So people who are in the workplace and say, here's a great opportunity, I want to invest in some of my staff and give them the opportunity to, to do this degree while they're working. So it meant that they're doing equivalent projects to the, to the other students, but their, their projects in that workplace and to do with their work, and that's, that's a fantastic way to do it. In that same scheme, there are people who are doing their degree that way. So they're school leavers and they decide, you know, I'm going to go to a company who's running this graduate apprenticeship scheme and I'm going to do my degree at University of Stirling. So it's a bit like what John was talking about. It's that whole ecosystem and having that flexibility and recognising not everyone learns. And this isn't a sausage factory we're talking about. This genuinely is education with a great big E. And people can come at it from very different directions and different ways of learning. So I think that was one example. That's sort of work-based learning and doing your degree by that approach recognizing that many of the people in the workplace are highly skilled doing you know really great job but actually there's a lot of disruption around things are changing and people need to respond quickly and this is a really great flexible way to do it they don't need to resign their post go back to being a full-time student we can actually combine them and find that that works really well so it is about opening our mind to the opportunities and thinking about what would what would really work as an economy what would really work as a society and work from what we need and work backwards rather than trying to fit things into specific silos or models Karen, could i just caveat what i just said because otherwise I, it, it will slip into another subject um I spent five very happy years as chancellor of the Open University. When the Open University started 50 years ago, 90% of its initial graduates for the first five years were teachers. 90% were teachers taking degrees in, the, in their own time. Now, what does trouble me, and picking up really what, what John said is, uh, remarkably few teachers now take a second degree. Mm -hmm. And yet we do know for sure, John and Maggie made the point, that like, it's not just lifelong learning, it's breadth of learning and everything else. Teachers, the new generation of teachers, having left teacher training college, that's a beginning, that's not an end. And I think for too many teachers for too long, it was like job done. And you, you, know, you revise your teaching slightly every year. The truth is, I was watching the other day a surgeon, a 50 year old surgeon, having to relearn how to do an operation he'd been doing for years because he was using new technology and a new means of doing it. Any doctor that any of us have who doesn't feel up to date with what they're doing, we would want to go to as a doctor. So I do think there's a job to be done within the teaching profession uh, to have teachers see themselves as learners, constantly learners. And I would be very encouraged if instead of, I think it's 7% of teachers, 6 or 7% of teachers take a second degree, that really ought to be 50%. That's a, that's a fantastic point, David. And um, I think one of the challenges that we've identified is over the past 12 months is the digital literacy of our teachers, of our children, of our parents. And to John, uh, this is a question from Sandra Flynn. What are the panel's thoughts on the inclusion of digital literacy in the forthcoming adult literacy, numeracy and digital literacy 10 year strategy for Ireland? John, what are your thoughts on that, please? Yeah, I think, um... I think we have to be careful to generalize. I think that's the first thing. I think what we've seen over the last number of months by both teachers and students is that despite the, all the challenges, they've done it actually. Mm -hmm. And they've done it notwithstanding the challenges. I think the, the heroes of today actually are teachers and the frontline staff that we've seen. And they've often been, they've often been treated poorly actually. Um, so I'm a big fan of teachers. I think David's point is well made. Coming to the literacy strategy, I think one of the things we're trying to do at UCC is actually try and identify what the baseline is. And in other words, you can only see growth if you know where you're starting from. So what we're trying to do at the beginning of every student that will register in UCC for a graduate attributes program is to have a self-assessment of digital competency. Um, 
And you know, all of us, and we know that will be looked like what's called a spiky profile. People will have different profiles of what that will look like. And all I want to do is to make sure we shift the lineup. Uh, but we can have all the strategies in the world, but if we don't resource things, we don't, mm. if we don't support the teachers and give them money and resources to enable things to happen, then we will run into trouble. You know, a very simple fact is that Ireland has the high, one of the highest participation rates in third level education in the OECD, amongst the highest. And why is it then that we like Latvia are in the endangered zone of funding for higher education in Europe? So you have that, you have that extraordinary, extraordinary situation where we believe in strategies, we do all great things, but actually strategies are only as good as if they're implemented. So I want to see, for the digital strategies just described, I want to see support for teachers, to give the teacher, my experience of most teachers, they're really excited, they want the students to succeed, whatever, and the learner to succeed. Give them the tools to do it, support them to do it, give them the mentoring, the peer support, and I, I guarantee you they will turn it around. So I think we need more than strategies, we need resources. And I think until we such do that, I think we'll run into difficulty. Thank you very much, John. Um, I'm just going to pivot away a little, uh, guys. Um, I'm, I'm going to direct this to Maggie. As a pioneer of geoscience research and application, how can universities be advocates for changes in a green future? Thanks, Kieran. Yeah, I've always been involved in multidisciplinary work. My research, as you mentioned, um, in geoscience focuses on biominerals, so how they record past climate, how they're being affected by the current ocean acidification with all the CO2 that we're pumping into the, the atmosphere. So I think it's really important to make the point that we all all have responsibilities here absolutely everyone most of us drive cars we certainly all uh, switch on computers and you know charge a mobile phone overnight i think you know fossil fuels you think about how that drove the industrial revolution and really changed economy and society we did that in a time when we did not genuinely did not know the damage that we were doing putting the co2 into the atmosphere we now know it and we have to act. There's no question about this. It's not about should we or shouldn't we. We absolutely have to act. So I think universities are really well placed. I think they've always been outstanding in terms of evolving with the knowledge that they seek and generate. I think there's really great opportunities through the technology that they can generate through the research that they can do through European Green Deal, etc. And I think that they must role model the really best behaviours. They must role model what has to happen. John spoke about, you know, carbon footprint. There's all sorts of things that we have to do, asking ourselves questions about, does that travel really need to happen? You know, pointing out all the best behaviours we know about where the sources of the CO2, lots of them people might not be so clear on that, you know, the, your meal on the on the dining table is actually a huge source of carbon so let's think about what do we model in universities what was available and um, by way of a food offering are they locally sourced why is the vegan and the vegetarian always at the bottom of the, of the menu why isn't it at the top with just you know one meat option all sorts of things that we can we can do um, and i think really importantly this was mentioned earlier about this interdisciplinarity. So I think really the really having humanities working together with scientists, not just identify, you know, here's a technology or something that can help, but what actually is acceptable and what will bring about the massive, massive changes in behaviour that are required. If we think we've changed behaviour over last year, there's a lot more behavioural changes that are required because by all calculations, we don't have a lot more than 10 years before we, we actually um, hit tipping points. So universities have a huge role and it's shared with every member of society, actually. Uh, thank you very much, Maggie. That's, uh, that's uh, usually valuable. Um, as we're talking about our green future, uh, David, what insights can you give into how work will change in the present and in the next five to 10 years from our experiences over the last uh, 12 months and the, just the evolution of technologies and our practices. Where do you see us going, uh, David? Well, I, 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 
you're in a sense asking one person, I'm, slightly, I'm somewhat pessimistic. I th actually think that the capitalist system, no, I'm not, not anti-capitalist, but the capitalist system as presently constituted only, fun only functions against uh, att attempts to, our, our attempts to reduce climate I issues. Uh, I got a figure the other day, it horrified me, that the London Stock Exchange has factored in a 3.5% rise in, the, in, in, te in temperature into its 20, 20, sorry, 2,100 estimates of where the economy will be. Well, human beings in many, many parts of the world can't live at three and a half times. So there's a kind of nonsense out here that we, uh, you know, my worry is we are hurtling towards something that we don't yet fully understand and hasn't been fully under explained to us. The positive answer, Kieran, is that we've got to look at where we live. So I'm very privileged living in West Cork, but West Cork itself has got to decide what it wants for its own future. We had an enormous battle, John will remember, two years ago, fighting off a plastic factory here. The idea that a plastic factory could have ever been a good idea was madness in West Cork, madness. And yet there were people who said, well, you know, it's gonna be 14 jobs and one thing or another. So I think that communities like ours have got to decide, what do you want to be? Because it's all gonna be, there will be trade-offs. The idea that, some of the, that, that we're not going to achieve what we want without trade-offs is, is another nonsense. So which trade-offs are we most comfortable making? And, and are they, are they, do they synchronize with the, the region or the area in which we live? There are people who want to live in cities for their own very, very good reasons. They make trade-offs. I personally, and many people around me here, want to live in a rural setting. We'll make trade-offs. Let's make the right trade-offs. That's the important thing. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, John, would you like to come in on uh, on some of those points that have been made? Sure, and I think I'd like to come to a question later that Siobhan is asking in the chat there, amongst others, in, in a minute. Um, so look, I've led our green, co-led our green agenda with our students in UCC. We have a very simple mission. It's student-led, research-informed and practice-focused. Students are the voice today. They are, want to challenge us about tomorrow. We must listen to them. We, Greta Thunberg and the people across the world have mobilised a, a completely different world in terms of what's happening. We've got to listen. We've got to listen. I think the universities can do a number of things. Um, I think I, somebody, David, would have heard me say this before. We, we, we have a very good sustainability agenda in our university. And I remember a workshop about three years ago on sustainability on the campus. And I went along in my usual way with my PowerPoints doing the usual kind of thing. And I think most people got kind of bored by it, to be honest. And then suddenly uh, our, prof our professor of creative practice gave a demonstration of sustainability through dance. Now, everybody thought it was a bit funny, actually, but there's a much deeper message here, and she's a superb colleague, Professor Jules Gilson. The issue here is that in some ways, we've got to speak to the heart as well as to the mind. And, and what we haven't done, perhaps on the climate change issue, is speak to the heart as much as we have to the mind. And I think Irish education, through the humanities, through music, through poetry and creative practice, give us a moment in time and we hear Joe Biden citing Seamus Heaney. The more we hear that and speak to the heart, or together with the mind, then I think we have a real chance of purpose. And a university is a place where that magic happens, where you get to collision. And we can now see it in Horizon 2020 projects, where there's no longer the hard scientists on their own working over here. You're bringing social scientists, you're bringing political scientists, and you're bringing other disciplines to the mix, to Maggie's point about interdisciplinarity. The world isn't built in silos. The world is built through connections. So I think we have a responsibility um, to actually enable that to happen. And I'm actually confident, um, notwithstanding the, David's really uh, warning to us in terms of the timelines on this, I'm confident that we will respond. I remember, I, uh, even, even though I've published on climate change impacts on ecosystems, I remember being at a conference um, in, the, in the 90s and the insurance companies were practicing and already planning the actuarial risks for climate action. Now, they're much, well, I can say mathematicians are much smarter than me. So maybe to David's point, maybe we need to listen to them also with our music, with our creative practice, and actually put the whole lot in together and say how to make the world a better place. But I'm confident our young people and not so young people will enable us to do that, you know. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, John. Um, as an open question to the panel, this is from John Fitzgibbon. Um, what are the panel's views taking John's comments on life-wide learning and how can we move to a position where individuals can be encouraged and be confident to pursue and value
you know, learning experiences that are at a level that is not necessarily above a qualification, they now hold, but at the same or even lower level if the knowledge and skills they require at that level. Is there anybody who would like to take that question? I was worried that David is going at half, so I want to hear David's voice on this one before we go. Uh, yeah. I'd love to. Thank you, John. Bless you, because I've got I, I'm under the cosh. Because uh, can I wrap this up with Stephen Lane's earlier question, which is actually a very good uh, and perfectly very proper question about atmosphere and warmth uh, can't be caught in, in a digital world. Um, I think the, the short answer to the question you just asked, Kieran, is listen to the students. Just listen. Get better at listening to them. We're not very good at listening to them. We're very, very good at telling them what we think, but we're don't, not good at listening to them. Uh, there's a program I've been running, and I think this is entirely germane, in the northeast of England. North, northeast of England is kind of underserved community, particularly in the area of my, my area of the, the creative industries and creativity. What we've done recently, and you couldn't, here's my point, Stephen, you couldn't do this other than digitally. What I've done is collected together a group of people from the Northeast who've been extraordinarily successful and gotten to talk about it uh, in a very encouraging. So I've got Ridley Scott, Lee Hall, the playwright, uh, David Parfit, who got, got picked up six Oscar nominations on Monday. I mean, really, really good people. Getting them to talk about the fact they came from areas and regions that appeared to be hopelessly underprivileged and where the world, when looked at, let's say the movie world, looked impossible, or the, the world of Broadway, in case of Lee, Lee. And yet they then took the audience through how they've managed to do it. So what we're trying to do is encourage young people to see the possibilities of their lives, not to allow themselves to get trapped or get put in guardrails, but actually see the potential that they have. And you can only do that by encouraging them and listening to them. And we haven't been very good at that. So, you know, we're doing this in the Northwest. We're doing it also similarly in the, in the Northeast, sorry, in the Southwest. Another very under remarkable levels of deprivation in the southwest of England. So we're doing it. That can only be done. I could never put that together other than through di the digital means. So what I'd say to Stephen is, yes, again, I said about trade-offs. Yes, you trade some stuff off, but some of the stuff you're able to collect and some of the examples you're able to use for people are quite extraordinary. And I'd like to think that the 120 students we were talking to on Monday really got something out of each one of these six sessions we're running. David, thank you very much. I know you have to step off, but I would uh, absolutely listen to you for, for days. Um, your insights are hugely, hugely valuable, and um, I look forward to chatting to you again. Um, I can say thank you very much for everybody. I mean, John and Maggie, I guess I'll see you both soon, and I'm massive admirers of both of them, so, well, this is a very nice team to be on. I wouldn't want to be on any other team. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you very much, David. Right. Kieran, can I go to Siobhan's question there? I think Siobhan is, is a parent of an 18-year-old currently preparing for Leaving Cert to 2021. I think we urgently need to start this innovative thinking at the second level. It's witness I'm witnessing a young person who's heavily burdened with the need to go through a dense curriculum. Not much time else with life at this point in time. And I think, you know, it kind of connects with what David just said, actually. Um, to me, this is a moment in time. Uh, and I think, uh, and I hope Siobhan will encourage her son, he doesn't, he's a, he's a parent, he doesn't say if it's, a, if it's a young or boy, excuse me, it could be a male or female. Um, uh, th the question is, is how can we get that voice listened to? And it's beginning to happen. Who would have said that the government would have said, actually, we're going to consider giving you calculated grades or a leaving cert. One year ago, we were struggling even to have a leaving cert. Then we moved to a calculated grades, works and all. And, I, you know, we can talk about the ups and downs of both of that. But I think what I'm really intrigued by is that for the first time ever, the learner has been put at the center. And he's an 18 year old. He's not a child. This is an adult, actually. Or she is it either. So we've got to listen to these voices. We've got to liberate them to become learners and curiosity driven rather than a sucking information or being poured into information poured in. So I hope that there'll be an educu education revolution where we we'll say, actually, let's try some new models, calculated grades, other algorithms perhaps of coming in through the CEO and a range of other things um, to enable a, a, a different route for those who want to come to higher education. Not everybody wants to or should actually, but I think the most important thing, if someone wants to, you know, there's a narrative creeping in that we should do X number of this and X number of that. I don't buy into that actually. I think we need our young people for them to decide where they'd like to be. And there are many, many paths to the, through the, this journey of learning. And there are many destinations. And the most important thing is we give the capacity for our young people and not so young people, for second time learners, third time learners and fourth time learners 
to, to map out that pathway. So I think Siobhan uh, and your 18-year-old, uh, I'm confident that, that in all of the next few weeks will be like, I'm sure, um, that this will be a special moment for, for your, your person, your 18-year-old in your house. Um, but please, let's start that revolution to change a new way for assessment of learning as well as as learning and, and so that we actually do something different. Thank you very much, John. Maggie, I want to direct a, a combination of two questions to you. Uh, what the, it's, Michael has identified, does online learning offer specific opportunities to regional communities and the disadvantaged? And Neov has highlighted uh, um, the further education, there is a significant drop off in participation by marginalized learners. Uh, can you share your views on um, on the on those two points, uh, trying to bring them together, please? Yeah, thank you. I think there are really positive opportunities in terms of regional learning, um, and MTU are really sensitive, really aware and proud of the fact that we have that rural urban mix, and I think that's that's one of our strengths that we can um, really help to to support both. Um, one of the really, I, I think, reflecting on the last year, one of the things that I've been really pleased with is the opportunities for inclusion. Um, and I use that inclusion in a very broad sense. Um, it could be inclusion of different types of learners. I think the fact that we can do things in a synchronous and an asynchronous way, people can come back to things, you know, listen to that video and fast forward or slow down for a particular point they want to tune into. And that flexibility doesn't just suit people who learn in different ways, but people who have, you know, other caring responsibilities, whatever people's personal circumstances can be. So I think what it gives us in flexibility can also be helped in inclusion. But it's not enough to just say that, you know, technology enhanced learning is there and that will take care of it. We are on a, on a learning journey about where the strengths are and where the weaknesses are. So it's really about designing in what works and actually um, deliberately helping and helping with retention. I was talking about how it could help with international students or any new student arriving. And I think students coming from, from environments which are perhaps less privileged than others, a big piece of the determinant of success is, is whether they feel that they belong. And I think the more that we work there to hook people in and to help them have a sense of belonging, and you may think that that would be more difficult when we're working remotely, actually designing things in so that people are working in really small groups. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, you know, know a few people, so you go into another setting, those are people. You, so you've broken down lots of those barriers, you've broken down the idea that that's a university, you know, high on the hill, that's not a place to which I should ever think that I would belong. So I think it's about designing all of those in. It's not all there yet, but I think there's real potential for us to, to do a better job to think about people with disabilities who may find that that's a real struggle to have to travel every day for, for um, all, all sorts of reasons that we can actually build a much better system that's more inclusive and helps people to feel that they genuinely do belong. Thanks very Did much. Did that answer all the questions? I was mindful there was a couple of parts. I don't know if, yeah. I, if I swept <laughs> them all up there or if I left any out. No, that's fantastic. John, do you want to come in on some of yeah, those? I was going to come in. I was really going to come in. Yeah, I was going to come in with that and combine it with John Fitzgibbon's question that he asked earlier that David started to answer. And it's building on what Maggie has said, and I'd like to move the conversation to credentials. Um, so when we when we look at awards today, um, they're very variable, and you know we're kind of stuck in a model that the universities and 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 and, and higher education and on all levels of education have, have given credentialing of, of learning on the national qualification framework. We know there's five, six, eight, seven, eight, nine, and ten is PhD and so forth. And I think the kind of learner that John is talking about there, I think, and, the, and recognizing learning, um, both formal and informal learning, is really, really important. And, you know, there is a whole new system emerging of micro-credentialing, and the universities in Ireland are, are working on that together. So what do I mean by micro-credentials? Well, micro-credentials can vary from a digital badge, which is credit or non-credit bearing. So at the moment, we have the Bologna process, which we assemble our degrees and, and our qualifications into a particular kind of basket, if you like, and then we, there's a certain number of those. 
a statement of achievement, which is non-credit bearing. It could be basic knowledge and skills required to perform a specific task or a college approved certificate. And we've started, we've issued in, we've issued some about 500 digital uh, badges of different credentials in, in UCC over the last five years. But what's really interesting is New Zealand, Canada, and many European countries are now st are starting to look at how you might recognize the learning that John is talking about there, where people are today. So you, you recognize that this is a competence that if someone has learned and you give them some credit for it. And then they can, they can hold that or they can build on that. And I think, you know, the examples in, in New Zealand, for example, range from a really important topic at the moment, specialist skills to mentor for health or well-being. I mean, the well-being of our students and our staff is probably the single most important thing that I'm facing today. Uh, if we can support some learning in that with some sort of credential. Workplace digital literacy. We've just talked about digital literacy. Wouldn't it be great if we give some credential to that? It may be non-credit non bearing or it could be credit bearing. So I think there is a real opportunity for us to reimagine the world of, of credentials. You know, what's so magical about four years or three years? I, if David was here, he would say, actually, the first degree is for growing up and the second one is for learning. Um, and, you know, that privilege isn't enjoyed by everybody to be able to, to dedicate a, a batch of time uh, for learning. So we need to, and the words might be wrong here, but we need to slice and dice the pieces of learning such that they are accessible, not for everybody, but they're accessible um, because some people want to take the routine pathway, um, but that these are accessible for people to be a flexible learner, to credit existing work-based learning, uh, formal and informal learning, to give people the pathways of recognition of what they can do. And I think, and also gives them the confidence. I've never known anybody that hasn't got some award of once more. Thank you very much, John. Um, I have a question here from Mary. And I'll direct this to, to Maggie. Are there opportunities for creativity and how can this be translated into the future of work? It's a... Yes, thank you, Kieran. So I think for clarification, when we're talking about skills, I would be including creativity there. I mean, think about it, certainly MTU, it's really important for a new university. I think it's extremely important for for our society and our economy. And I think one of the many lessons that we've learned during COVID is the extent to which we've really called on creative outputs to, to help us through this. So I think there would be a real risk if we were to dismiss creativity. I think from, in my mind, it's included in that whole, whole skills mix. Thank you very much. Um, John, to you, please. How do you think the third level institutions could better deal with student intake and could rethink on points in mm. school better sites of learning? That's a really good question. question. And, and um, this is one we struggled with. Uh, so we, there's been a conversation going on over the last number of weeks and months. It reflects the, the question that Siobhan asked about the leaving cert in some ways um, and points and all of that area. So we've got to try and, so I should say up front, I'm conflicted, so I might as well make, declare a conflict here. Um, the the, the registrars, as, I, as I, I hold two roles at the moment, the registrars um, and, and of the universities are the directors of the central application office. The central application office is owned by the third level, owned by the universities together with um, some representative TIA and the HEA, but we largely own it. So we set the agenda for admissions um, for universities. And Stephen Byrne now, who's our interim registrar, is doing that for me at the moment. Now, so that's the first part. The second part then is what criteria we use for admissions to university. So there are what we call matriculation. So we expect a certain performance at certain levels of, of whatever they were. I'm not even sure anymore at this stage. And, and the reason I say that is we've got ourselves into, the, into, this, um, into this milieu of, of educational credentialing, um, regardless, despite what I said earlier. And we, we heard at the beginning, Ronnie is saying that people were doing the HPAT in, from Ludgate, for example. So we've created this kind of industry of, of credentializing and learning and putting a pathway of points at the end of that. So that's the target to go to. And we know that uh, the analysis has been done. Um, we know that people that are current really fine good surgeons and consultants today, women and men, uh, probably wouldn't pass the HPAT actually. Um, so we have this kind of mismatch of admission criteria. Um, sometimes they're very good, sometimes they're very, very poor. So what we've got to try and do is to look at the new thresholds of learning that will enable students to, to find their pathways into that entry point. And that might be, so Paddy Prendergast in Trinity has recently been saying that 
you know, if a student wants to study English at university, maybe we might weight English in their Leaving Cert in a different way than we might weight something else. And we can do this with digital technology now because the algorithms can spin much faster. In the past, we'd all a paper-based system. So there's no reason, says he, um, I, I would give a big job for somebody, but I'm sure, but I, there's no reason, theoretically at least, that we can't look at new ways of reimagining entry requirements into the institutions. I'm probably one of the few people on this call, and I'm maybe I'm, I'm making false assumptions, that has corrected the metric. Um, so the metric was an exam for people may or may not remember. Uh, it was an examination that people took uh, when they were in Leaving Cert. Um, and I did it myself. Uh, and it was a second shot at the Leaving Cert, if you like. Um, and you know the matriculation, it was a huge burden. We couldn't do it today with the level of participation. But what we are doing today, we're doing a calculated grade and a sitted exam. And maybe we need another layer of something else. And we need another layer of, of algorithms to enable a selection of different characteristics of students to get them on the right program. UCC has the highest retention rate of all first year students in the state, 94%. And we put that down to the, our fantastic staff and, and our fantastic students, but getting the student to choose the best and the right program for them. That's the most important thing. Um, and you know, where Siobhan was there earlier with, with her 18 year old leaving cert, the most important thing that leaving cert students is to get the program that they love, that they enjoy. So we, what we've, our responsibility then is to create that pathway into the higher education institutions to enable that enrichment to happen. It's not easy, but there is opportunity with technology to look at new ways through the CEO and other areas. Thank you very much, John. Uh, we, unfortunately, we are starting to close down the clock. And I, just a short question for both of you before we finish. Um, for, um, what career advice would you give to the fifth and sixth year students tuning in? Just a short, uh, short question, please, to Maggie first. Thank you, Kieran. I would really encourage you to follow your passion. Um, so I knew that I really enjoyed science, but I had no idea about biominerals, no ideas what opportunities were going to be in front of me um, for a career. And that is going to be even more so nowadays, doesn't it, when careers that fifth and sixth years are going to pursue ultimately probably don't even exist yet. But it's really important to work hard. And I think that's much easier to do if you're dealing with something that, that genuinely is your passion. I think it's about making the most of all of the opportunities that come your way. And if you've done your very best, I think then that enhances those opportunities that are there. There are many people in life that will put limits on you. Many people who will tell you, oh, surely you can't do this and you can't do that. So I would advise you don't put any on yourself. Absolutely don't put any on yourself. Things will go wrong. And it's something that we don't probably see often enough that there will be sort of trials and tribulations in life. But actually, that's where the real learning takes place and that's where people grow. So don't think that you have to give up as soon as you trip at the first hurdle. And one thing I'd like to finish with, and that there has been a, a sort of comment, there's a question about lack of peer support and social contact. I would just really like to acknowledge that it's been such a hard time for fifth and sixth year students. Honestly, such a trial and tribulation to do without the social interaction. Everyone is aware of the challenges and how tough that has been. So in terms of career advice, I would also really encourage fifth and sixth year pupils to seek all of the help and support that's out there. Um, and to really use that to help you plan the next stages. It's been a tough time. Thank you very much, Maggie. John, uh, I, same question to you, please. Yeah, I, I think my, Maggie has covered it all, really. And my answer, really, follow your dream. <laughs> follow your dream. Um, and that's all, you know, and I say this as a parent, don't listen to your parents. <laughs> uh, because I think, look, you, because, pa look, passion, to Maggie's point, passion is what's going to drive you even at these most darkest of moments and and I think it would be wrong Kieran if I don't mind just going back to the chat I mean there are I see it as an MTU student and probably no different from UCC student and a teacher who are really struggling today um, yeah. you know I think if we're all honest actually we probably all are struggling a little bit actually and it's okay that's okay but I think to the specific question there are all we can do and Maggie might want to comment specifically about MTU but I think I think all of us as educators want our students to be mentally well, 
and learning optimally. Um, and I think what we'd like you to do is to A, support them as much as you can as a parent or if you're living or whoever you're living with, but most importantly, to reach out to us if you're not, if you are in trouble, if you feel vulnerable, if you feel isolated. Both our organisations, and I hope Maggie doesn't mind me saying this, are well equipped to support our students. We work very closely together. Our students' unions work closely together. They often live in the same houses, our students from MTU and UCC together. They often support each other. So I'd like a very strong message going out to everybody on this webinar. The world isn't perfect, but we have fantastic people to support those vulnerable, all of us, the vulnerable moments that we all visit in these times. And we want to support you, and we want you to feel valued and valuable. First year is really tough. Yeah. They've never been in MTU. They've never been on the campus in UCC. But all I say to them, you might say, there's an exciting time coming. Very soon you'll be on the campus. Very soon you'll be in, in the places that matter. And you'll forget all about this. Um, I know it doesn't seem like that now, but I'm absolutely confident that when those students walk into MTU or UCC in the autumn, they'll be full of joy, full of vigor, and ready for the dream that follows them. I'm absolutely sure of that. But please reach out, whether you're a teacher or a faculty member, or indeed a student of our institution or anywhere with John, John Fitzgibbon is here from the Cork ETB. We want to support all the learners because this is a very tough time, but you will do it. Thank you very much, John. Um, I would like to sincerely thank our panelists. It is a great privilege to be in the company of world-class education leaders and it, is, uh, it has been really, really enjoyable. And in closing, I think um, what really resonates with me was the pace of change and the range of opportunities that will now be available to rural locations. We no longer have to be reliant on migrating from the region to access educational opportunities at any level. Um, Ludgate has a second site coming on stream in the coming months with the refurbishment of Mercy Heights. This will have particular focus on education, innovation and training for all ages. We also continue to offer our study space with discounted packages available to, for students. If you as a parent or if you're a student, be sure to contact us at info at ludgate.ie. And for further information, please log on to our website at ludgate.ie. I would like to take the opportunity again to thank the participants. I would like to take the opportunity to thank our audience. The questions are fantastic and they really make this event possible. The, remember, a recording of this web webinar will be made available on our website in the next few hours. And again, a final thank you to David, Maggie and John for the exciting insights into education and where we are going. What? With that, I will conclude this webinar and ask you to take care as we reach the final stages of this pandemic. And I would like to thank our sponsors, AIB, and our sponsors, Vodafone and Syro, for making this all possible. Thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you Maggie. Thanks, Kieran. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. 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 Bye, everyone. Thank you so much.